Continuation of a long journey many of us have had together. Okay? So I will say things and uh, I'm glad Makran is here because I want to also familiarize you, Makran, about our yagna, what it is we're doing. And it is not a humanities conference in a normal sense. And then I'll also be frank and give you my response to the humanities, why they failed. In fact, in the United States, they're downsizing now. And they're scared of the collapse of humanities and the myth of humanities and its promise has failed. So we are, why do we want to import a failed model? You know, that, that sort of thing. But I'll, I'll, I'll hold that for later. I want to say that uh, this conference series is born out of a process that many of you have been a part of in various forums we've been together online and in physical meetings and so on for some of you for a very long time. And there are four or five buzzwords that we have coined and all of us have been part of discussing this over and over again. So I'll just remind those who may be new. We subscribe to the following and that's why we came together to this conference in the first place. We subscribe to the fact that there is a Kurukshetra, which some people may call globalization. Some people may call a clash of civilizations. We're talking about intellectual, we're not talking about physical war here. Some may say the discourse, some may say comparative something or other going on. But we see it as an intellectual playing field with competing forces. You may call it market competition. But there is some kind of a Kurukshetra. And in this Kurukshetra, we need intellectual Kshatriyas. We need people who are debaters, who can argue a point of view. Uh, you know, and that is where the Puru Paksha, Uttar Paksha tradition comes. And we believe that these ought to be not individuals here and there, but there ought to be a home team. So there has to be team work, loyalty to the team, projects, plans, deliverables, and so on, leadership. So there is also management and uh, uh, teamwork, uh, you know, development aspect to this. And we believe that this, the individuals have to have this as a swadharma. It's not a mercenary, as Makaran says, it's not a mercenary kind of a thing. Uh, it is a swadharma, which means you have to have had enough transformation in your own sight, in your own being, that, that you are, you have a swadharma concept. You've transformed and you are dedicated a good deal of your energy resources towards this swadharma. And we believe that the yajna is the collective aspect of the swadharma. My personal swadharma is mine, but our, my yajna is something I invite all of you to join if it also happens to fit your swadharma. You don't have to. And if you join, you're not doing me a favor. You're, you're doing your own swadharma. So this yagna is that process where a whole lot of people participate because everybody's yagna has this commonality. It's a common denominator. So this is how, this is how we see the movement. It's located. It's not located in how do we publish a paper and get it into EPW so that I can get it into my CV and then I'll be a better pro uh, academic guy and I'll get promoted. We, we couldn't care less. We're seeing it as our yagna carrying out our swadharma. Therefore, when you look at it this way, the, uh, the idea of tapasya is very important in this swadharma. These are all terms that we've debated, argued between e-groups and you know, you guys, we, we've all been in together for a very long time. So I won't uh, describe them in detail, but I think the terms are fairly self-explanatory. So this is, this is the Sv so Deshi ideology is a movement to do that. Now we are going to pick a different target every year so that we are not vague. I have sponsored over a hundred conferences and I know why they're bogus, most of them, and I've attended many more. 
they do not have a ground changing impact because a lot of people come they give talks on many different sp- very fuzzy things you don't know what the guy is saying half the time and there is no kind of direction there is no change direction to to what generally going on we want to be different and we want to actually have something which is creating an intervention in the di- in the discourse and bringing about change and so there are two aspects to it like i said in the in the first talk i gave uh, two days ago there is the the deconstruction and the reconstruction yeah so there is there, there you can think of them as a negative or a positive pulling out the weeds and planting the roses there is both of that so it's not just negative things we're doing so the ancient ideology will also construct based on archaeological evidence what what we can now say about our ancient history we can in doing those kind of conferences also so so the ancient ideology is a broad kind of re rediscovery of ourselves kind of a journey okay so that being the case the reason i'm very happy the reason i'm very happy about the outcome of this is i'm no i'm not feeling alone anymore i'm telling you my this is my feeling i felt alone for a long time every time i do a book i get attacked and i get deserted by my own people because when the, they all for me say sir go fight sir ah chalo who you are great and the moment one bullet is fired at me or run off then some people say what oh, you are so good nothing will happen to you you fight on your own sir <laughs> <laughs> some people say the devata is the protector don't worry but they are not there okay so i trick you guys i trick you guys to get in on the video of uh, suresh and take a stand and these videos will be edited and will put out everywhere you can't back out of it <laughs> okay ha huh? so I, wait a second no no this is no hand and like that you step no what what is that i have not to say so please now i made this mistake in the when you don't even intervention similar pattern when i talked about when you don't even same thing people said why are you focusing on one person uh, she's not all that bad she also good she was actually a hero at that time the man hindus and new temples would invite her give a lot of honorarium in chicago and all these places she was considered like the good hindu uh, promoting hinduism a lot of our kids would go there like so when this was exposed uh, by me way back 15 20 years ago and this book academic hindu phobia now being released by swam dr swami on sunday is actually a repackage a republishing of my old essays at that time so at that time we had the same people say like now people say why are you obsessed with the pollock i tell you within 2 years this will be the hottest topic pollock will become pollock studies pollock critiques all these post modern guys have been sleeping for all these decades will suddenly wake up and start studying him and the traditional scholars will also pick it up you can i am predicting you that okay and this is also what happened with when you don't ever once once the, all the I, i took all the firing firing and the blaming and accused being accused of all sorts of things but eventually what happened is a lot more people on our side starting getting involved getting involved and so this kind of triggered more action from both sides the mistake i made is i did not create home team i kind of started this battle and abandoned it to move on to the next book and the next book i should have had this kind of a thing to create 20 guys who take on the stand publish their book then i could sneak out and then they have a fight <laughs> so you know what you you are okay. see so now you like it or not you are the home team because that is required this is your tapas this is your tapas this is your yagna i have said it all along it's not a trick i always said don't do unless your swadharma calls you to do this okay and reversing the gaze and having the confidence and having this uh, reclaiming your adhikar like they had this uh, you know occupy wall street kind of movement so we are doing occupy ideology we are occupying what's ours taking it back yeah so if it is your calling you do it otherwise don't it is not some kind of a uh, you know part of your sarkari job or something that you just do these things and you go around you are not professional this is an advantage of not being a professional humanities scholar because you are not doing it as part of your profession and worrying about what this guy will think and will i get my next grant and will they invite me for a talk there you are not worrying about that this is this is your this is that part of your life which is truly yourself this is truly yourself rather than some some job related kind of a thing so there are disadvantages not being inside the system but there are also advantages 
I will tell you this, that we put out this call for papers and invited everybody. Uh, there is no reason the humanities people couldn't have presented more papers. There is no reason the Sanskrit uh, traditionalists couldn't have presented more papers. But Kanan, Professor Kanan predicted that, you know, the Sanskrit people, a lot of them, just not good enough or not uh, energized enough and they're not, uh, they're just going to sit and comment and pontificate, have a lot of opinions, but they're not going to actually do the hard work. And so neither the humanities, post-colonial people, post-modern people have been at the front of this battle. Whether it was Henry Doniger, whether it was my, whatever, this is my fifth book, uh, all the way up to Pollock, they have not been the ones who really done this, nor is it the traditional Sanskrit people. So this is our problem too. So people who are boxed in as ultra specialists are sold out. They're part of various vested interests. And it's very difficult. And maybe they're mediocre. I gave so many millions of dollars of grants. I mean, he says I'm not a generous guy, but I am poor because I did, overdid it. I overdid it. Yeah. I genuinely just said, okay, you should just give it. Huh? So, but that's my foolishness. And I learned that I trusted a lot of people that I should not have, you know. So, I learned a lot of things as a byproduct of that. And that is that people who are in certain professions are not qualified, not that smart to revolutionize their thinking because they're product of that. They're inside, the, they're sitting and looking at it from inside. And you have to be on the outside to look at it differently. So uh, the most of the, and there was no bias, the reviewers, there were three reviewers, very tough factor, who reviewed. And it was blind reviews. Nobody knew which pa whose paper it is they're reviewing. And it so happened that majority of the papers that got selected are by people from science, technology, IT, this and that. Huh? So before we criticize that, okay, they're a bunch of scientist type people, they're not formally trained. Maybe that's a blessing. It can also be that they're more creative. They're more logical. They're more analytical. And I also see that this whole facade and edifice of social sciences needs to be attacked and critiqued as a whole system because this is a Western way of thinking. The social sciences and humanities is alien to us. It is a kind of a oppression. We are being colonized by these theories and we don't need them. So if you look at, uh, you know, in physics you have stable equilibrium and then it can destabilize, break down and then all these parts move around until another stable equilibrium happens, you know. So you have a glass and you topple it, it boom and there's a chaos, but then there is, the, that's another stable equilibrium with all that thing sitting there, it's a stable equilibrium too. And then you throw it in the trash and you have, that's another stable equilibrium. So this crisis of myth of humanities, humanities as a myth that the Westerners have the ability to develop these theories and come up with the objective truth about human beings all over the world, of all cultures, fit them into these kind of theories, that myth is actually failing. It is failing because humanities in the West are actually downsizing. They're having difficulty getting enough students. People are going for hard sciences because they're practical or medicine or this or that or business. They're going into things that are practical even in India. It is happening in the West also. So these very uh, humanities oriented things are not uh, considered that uh, relevant. And it's sad because I think that they do offer quite a lot. But they have also to be blamed because they went overboard in asserting too much claim to truth, too much arrogance. And therefore, uh, you know, they just, this is a bad karma, I guess, for them. They've done quite a lot of bad karma. So I'm not uh, a big fan that uh, we have to necessarily, uh, uh, you know, uh, toe the line and fit into the social sciences. And the remark that uh, one article in EPW will be worth more, I'm not sure I agree with it. That's old school thinking. I think that uh, you can get a million people on social media following you, you probably make more impact than uh, uh, an article in EPW which maybe 200 people will read. I mean, the total readership of the, a typical academic book published in India is in the hundreds. You believe that? It is in the hundreds. Whereas we're, we're reaching lakhs. And there's a difference. This is, this is, this is the new, that is old school when only 
certain channels of knowledge flow existed and people were gatekeepers, they could regulate that. And so if you did not impress the editors of EPW, then you could be blacklisted, you see. And I'm saying I don't even care about you guys. You can blacklist me all you want because, because the real people are out there. I have ways of reaching them and they're not going to read EPW anyway. So this is the real age of the Amar. So there is a case to be made for the Amagni knowledge. We said this is not the elitist guy sitting in some, uh, you know, uh, academic position. Though actually, the brick and mortar university is in threat. There is a meeting of major universities in the United States, and one guy from the Princeton administration said that these billions of dollars of mighty buildings and campuses and very beautiful stuff, we don't know if people in the next generation will be filling it up because they're going online these online courses, online. So there's one physics professor in Princeton, he's got 200,000 online students in his course on, Princeton, on physics, and they get credit. So people are going to new distance learning kind of methodologies, and so the university of the future may not be a physical place, maybe they'll have need some, for certain things like laboratory or surgery, you need to learn, you be in a physical place, perhaps. But for a lot of things, it's going to go distant. So this is threatening the structure. Once it goes distant learning, then you know, you may be able to, you as a person sitting in Hong Kong may apply to be the professor and you teach the course and the university will not require you to relocate and live in one place. So the teachers may also be anywhere. So you may think of this as Uberization of education. <laughs> Uberization of education, yeah? So the Uberization of education means that this old system of control and who gets in and who's, who's right and what not is being dismantled. This is what's happening. Knowledge is becoming Googleized. Googleization of knowledge. So you click and you know somebody's thing pop up and uh, somebody else's doesn't. There's no peer review deciding who's, whose idea, who will be pop, uh, top in the search. So this is, whether you like it, whether you want to hate it, this is reality. You have to deal with reality. So that's the way the world is moving. So therefore, we have to be compatible with this kind of a world and not worry too much about, you know, the old institutionalized systems, whether we are part of that or not. So I'm very happy uh, the, uh, this. Now, the critique of Pollock, why didn't the post-colonialists who are, so first of all, the, the field called post-colonial is supposed to have made us post-colonial, means decolonized, but they are some of the most colonized people. Post-colonial studies has failed because in the last 40, 50 years, it has not gone as one inch towards decolonization. If that was its promise, as the name suggests, it has failed. So what is post-colonial about colonial? It is a recolonization. It is not post-colonization, it is decolonization. There is a new kind of a colonial thinking. They've imported, uh, rejected the old colonial social science models and imported new ones. So why is it that Pollock never got criticized or never got studied until I started doing it. There is not one important work done by the so-called people whose job is to do that. Not one. But believe me, in the next 12 to 24 months, everyone will be jumping on the bandwagon and claiming, yeah, 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 you know, I'm this Pollock studies, I'm like, kind of that. You will see a lot of publications now coming out. You will see that. Same thing happened with Wendy Doniger. Nobody had bothered. Now, you know, the question is, is this proper psychology, is it proper, uh, your hermeneutics is proper, is all this is all over the place, people are talking about it, but it was an outsider who had to open this up. So you cannot count on the insiders of this academic field to be self-critical. That's a trap, they are in. They're stuck in that, in that mode. And um, I have written about Pollock. 11 years ago in 2005 Bangkok conference, which was a decade before the recent one, I gave a talk called Geopolitics and Sanskrit. The uh, crown princess was sitting there. 10 years later, I reminded her that I, in that earlier talk, 2005, I mentioned Sheldon Pollock. I quoted him. It, they, it's in the, online in my paper. It, they published it in, the, in their journal in Thailand. It was a leading article in that journal. And I, I quoted what he's talking about, this whole Nazi philosophy uh, thing and all that. I don't mention it over there. So it's like, even if, even if then the post-colonial people had started looking at it, at least they would have had an 11 year head start. But they didn't. So they, what is the excuse? Why are they so inbred into their own theories and depressing each other and little cabals here and there? 
and have not gone out and done pioneering work of this kind. And we in Swadeshi Indology intend to do that. We will, we will uh, open up new frontiers of knowledge, investigation, and then all these Sarkari uh, scholars will be coming to copy it and uh, take it, which is good. We want that. We want to open doors and let these guys join us. Okay. So uh, the uh, the multidisciplinary nature of our approach says. You know, you should be a physics person, come and join us. You should be a technical person, come and join us. You should be a computer scientist, come and join us. This, the, the study of who we are and our civilization and the nature of the human being is not something disconnected from all of this because science is going to rapidly uh, change things. And so you may be a neuroscientist, you may be a cognitive scientist, all this is very important. In, and the humanities have no place for that. The humanities as currently constituted, one of the speakers even said, or one of the person asking the question, physicist lady somewhere here, she even said that this is all old physics, obsolete physics, on which the humanities continue to uh, do their thing. Uh, even 100 years uh, obsolete Newtonian physics they are still using. They are still using the <laughs> That is the so, you know, so what we are saying here is there is also, besides the clash between you know the Indian view and the Western, there is also a clash of disciplines. They're both important part. There is a clash. This is the scientific nerds like me fighting back. It is a nerd in me called fighting back and saying, I want my tradition from these guys in, the, in social sciences and I don't trust that what they have been writing about. And it's nothing to do with whether they're Indian or not. This, that those disciplines have actually uh, lost credibility. And the scientific people are the ones who are going to make money, get jobs, have positions of power uh, in more. That's the way the world is moving. And so they want space and they want to invade this uh, field of uh, you know, studying India and studying so on. So I think it's a good thing that a lot of untrained officially people are getting in. There was a, there was a famous, uh, Ross, Perot was a, Ross Perot was a presidential candidate, he was a businessman. And he, he was, he, his calling card was that he was not a politician. And he ran as an independent candidate, got more votes than any independent candidate ever got. And in the presidential debates, usually there are two, Republican and Democrat. This time there were three. He was the third one. So a very amazing uh, character. Of course, he didn't win this many years ago. But somebody, his opponent said, you do not have the experience. So his answer right quick way, he said, I have no experience in the corruption of the government, I have no experience in the deficit of the government, I have no experience in creating unemployment. He listed all the problems and said, I have no experience in that. And the people just applauded because they wanted a fresh person outside. So this is probably what the state of the humanities could be seen as. Also that the humanities have not really delivered what they are supposed to. So I am happy that uh, it, it, what we want is that when you are doing these Pollock exercises, you have to read closely. And the reason multiple people are doing the same topic is that you also learn from each other. And so uh, we did four topics. I have a map of Pollock's intellectual thinking, which I haven't published. And in that, there's about 10 or 12 modules. We've done four. So there's many more modules. And then how these modules fit into an architecture is very brilliant, very brilliant. How the output of this then gets used, assumed over there. Even though he did not prove anything here, but in the next one he will assume that is the truth. And then which module he will contradict, he will not use, even his own. So he's got many, many things floating around, many, he pick and choose, configure it for this particular article's purpose. That's very kind of clever. So you have to study as, he said, you have to study the total system that he has in order to make sense of it. But you have to start slice at a time. If you try to dissolve, try to boil the ocean, you'll never get anywhere. You have to dissect parts, parts, then understand how they fit. So it will take multiple conferences. I mean, you don't learn this complexity that somebody has built in 40, in 40 years or so. You don't just learn it overnight. And remember, since the time they started working, Till today, it's been what three months? Yeah, that's all. Three months. Most of them never. Most of them never heard of Pollock. 
three months they're going to do this. It's pretty good, I would say. You guys have done pretty good. So um, each scholar, by reading Pollock on his own or her own and coming up with their own interpretation, it becomes your reality. Now it's no longer the Rajiv said it. You know it. This is your reality. This is your finding. So when you say he is clever, he's cunning, he's doing that, it's not anybody else, it's your discovery. This is very important. This transforms you, turns you into a scholar of this poor Paksh kind of thing. It's your thing. And so I'm happy, I and mean, whether whether we some multiple people are duplicating doesn't matter. It's the first time, and so we, we can we can definitely accept that. Uh, the idea uh, of uh, uh, let me just go through this quickly because uh, 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 I have so much more to say than just uh, Pollock. Uh, the, I have uh, modules I will send by email later that I feel the next five or six modules. And just like we took these four modules and gave you the complete reading list of him in each of them, so you don't have to go searching, you just read those things. We'll do that for the next batch of five or six modules. And so then you can start developing on that. And also we bring more traditional scholars and we would like to bring post-colonial scholars also. But they have to they have to come into the system, apply, send in an abstract, send in a paper. And we would we would love that the next conference should have not just you know science technology type outsiders, we would love the traditional Sanskrit people more represented, and we would love humanities people more represented. But then they have to they have to make an effort and not feel it's a kind of entitlement that they get. So in that, I'm hoping Makkalan can help us, you know, promote this idea with humanities people that, uh, you know, here is a call for papers and please take it seriously because they are the ones not taking it seriously. And similarly, uh, Professor Jha and uh, Kannan go, and, uh, go to the BB Parikshan list and various other places and advocate that they should get the, get involved in this, you know. We need, uh, we need that... Uh, Cross fertilization uh, happening. The, it is sad that uh, for a man, a Pollock outsider studies Western classics, Marxism, post Marxism, post modernism, all of that to apply to our system, collaborates for decades with Sanskrit traditional scholars. He hires them, he uses them, he, they, they get him awards. So he's totally aligned with these guys. But right here in our own country, the people in post-colonial studies and post-modern studies do not have the collaboration with the, our own Sanskrit people. Why, why, why not Indian guy, Delhi University, JNU, uh, you know, uh, Madras College, whatever, uh, co connect with the you know, Sanskrit people and start collaborative exercises to do all this. We, we don't have enough of that uh, going on. There, because we, we've been trained to think in a little box, you know, of our own. So these are uh, these are uh, issues. I'm glad I noticed. Uh, I'll just comment a few things I noticed were very impressive. I'm very happy that so many people of their own came up with the uh, with the conclusion that Pollock should be seen as a brilliant man. He should not be seen as a fool. Okay, and so the weak papers, I think, are the ones that trivialize him, name calling polemics, he's this and that, and therefore he's no good. I think the strong papers are the ones which say that what he's done is actually quite a remarkable accomplishment for one man to do. And then you have to go and figure out what your response is to that. That's more difficult than character assassination or bad intentions kind of a dismissal of a person. Uh, and they also caught, many of you also caught the sneakiness, the misquoting, uh, illogical, incomplete data you know, just quoting what suits you, <coughs> hiding the the actual pointing. You know, he almost refutes his own thesis sometimes, and then he quietly slips off, you know, move, moves away. So a lot of you caught that, and, and that is. Uh, and then you also caught. Uh, you also commented on uh, how he is very diplomatic, very polite, saying all kind of good things. Also, the diplomacy and hubris, a lot of complexity for no reason just to be sounding very lofty, and you've got that. And then the, the, I have a chapter in my book called, Is He Too Big To, uh, there's this business about are the banks too big to fail, you know? Yeah. Are they too big to fail, this kind of a statement. So I made this, call it too big to criticize. 
and in there I'm showing why he's built a very big image and it's like you how dare you you know you're attacking me who are you kind of this kind of an image and what why how he's done it all the awards he got the government of India this top president Sanskrit award you know he got Padam Shiri all these all the, uh, the NDTV all the friend of India award by India today you know all of these kind of India abroad so the various uh, accolades and his army of students and where they are implanted. So why he's become uh, somebody that you know is very dangerous to criticize. And you saw when I, when we had a petition against him, the multi-million dollar advertising PR campaign all over the media that he's the greatest guy and how can you ever manage, how can you criticize Time Magazine, Newsweek, New York Times, all kind of places had this sort of thing. CNN, or you were India, or every paper, mainstream paper, an unknown guy suddenly being hoisted as, and it has to be defended. You know, it's a very amazing feat. So that is to be studied. What's the power structure that has Indian power structure? Somebody relatively unknown to the Americans, because this business of Indology, very few Americans would be concerned about. And among the academic people, also very specialized kind of a fellow, you know, doing some very specialized thing. Uh, not somebody that you would ever show up in, uh, you know, uh, CNN in the U.S. or something like that would not. But suddenly Indians have hoisted him, and this happened in the British era. A lot of the British who were unknown, you know, kind of the second son or the third son, the first son would become lord and look after the family estate, and the the guy who was useless would be sent to East India Company, and he would <laughs> he would come back a multi-millionaire, and then he'd become bigger lord. Because India would be the place where he became somebody. So you see, you see that in a lot of uh, like this guy who runs the Jaipur Literary Festival, non-entity in his home country, but because he's this Western, this British guy, you know, he's like a big, huge figure. In, we've watched it. We we made these people great, and that greatness that we've given them here is what they cash out in their country. So Wendy Doniger and these kind of people became uh, in their in the eyes of the Western Academy. Very important because the Indians have bestowed upon them the honor of being the expert on Hinduism. See, so we have created these uh, monsters in a sense. We have created the problems for ourselves. So um, the uh, the study of Pollock, I think, has arrived. My book alone would not do it because my book would sell well. I, it would uh, make me a bit of a hero and a lot of a, a villain depending on whose point of view it is, it would be sensational. Uh, and then I would move on to another book and it would be like uh, the Wendy Doniger situation. Somebody, there were people who took over the Wendy Doniger fight in India. You know how it happened. I don't think they were the best people. They were not people who really went through the rigor. They just more into hitting, uh, emotional hitting. Uh, we've been hurt. Uh, this That's not how we want to fight this. So. This exercise we are going through, and we go through more of these, is going to create the level of rigor and the kind of team, and the, you, you have to be, you have to become better at articulating your point of view, defending your arguments. And right now we have 20. Hopefully next time we'll have 50. Because I want to have 108 people in my home team for intellectual kshatriyas who can be going around the world, going to panels, uh, going and you know arguing, debating. Uh, using whatever we have, whatever arguments are, being able to represent them. So that's that's where uh, where uh, I would like to take this. Um, then I want to, I want to basically say that uh, uh, if you look at the intellectual history of Pollock, the intellectual history of Pollock, there is that very early uh, person who's built the foundations for these building blocks. The two main things early on, the Ramayana and the Shastra came very early on, worked out, and then how different things are happening, and how uh, uh, after a gap, after a gap of seven eight years, suddenly in the early nineties, he's done some amazing few things. The deep Orientalism comes out, and this Ramayana thing, you know, that Ramayana is an anti-Muslim thing, it suddenly comes out. If you look at it, it's linked with his life and political situation. The Babri Masjid is a milestone. The book by uh, Edward Said is a milestone. So he's, he's very, really current with uh, 
the state of affairs. So, developing, I may, I may write something on his, his intellectual history, not biography, personal, but just what is the chronology of his development as a person, what are the building blocks, how they feed each other, I might do something like that, because that might, uh, that might help you. A comment I want to make on uh, the uh, remark that Makran made is very important that uh, the, the study of the other, we can't say wasn't done before. Kannan had said it was not done before and Makran said it has been done before. However, the examples of people who did it before are as individuals and not institutionalized. I think that's an important point. That there is a difference between, see the seminary in the United States standard, they have comparative religion. It's part of curriculum, part of curriculum. So it is not that there happened to be one guy who wrote a book, but it is, it is institutionalized, their study of us through anthropology, through various lenses, through Indology is a method of studying the other. We don't have a Westology. We don't have an Americanology, like they have an Indology. We don't have, so we do not have, if, if it is not formal, institutionalized, a legitimate field of study for us. Maybe one individual did it, another individual came and did it. But then after they are gone, where is it? It has not become, so, so Arya Samaj founder did it, we say, we, we, that he did some Puru Paksha. But what happened after that? After he's gone, no one continued the Puru Paksha tradition. And this has to be ongoing. You can't just do it once and forget about it. So the West has done a much better job of studying us than we have done the other way. And Chinese have an institutionalized study of uh, the West. Occidentalism is study is a subject. And people are trained to do that. There are groups whose job is to track violations of human rights by the United States. The groups in China. So every time the US issues this uh, human rights report saying what China has done, within a week or 10 days, the Chinese introduce their own reports on US, what they have done wrong. Because they have an institutionalized mechanism. It's not that somebody has done it once in a while. There's a difference between an individual and an institutional mechanism. We don't have those uh, institutional mechanisms. So I will, uh, uh, I will close, but I want to uh, leave, the, leave you with uh, uh, the idea th uh, that uh, uh, within a six month period or so, we want to have a second uh, Pollock conference, okay? Uh, where all those who are, whose papers are good quality this time should do more work and new people should be coming in. And I'm hoping that Professor Jha will get us some good young scholars, like Kannan got us some, maybe you introduce us to them now and we get them going because th we, we want a lot of Sanskrit people to get into this field, you know. Uh, so that would be uh, that would be a very useful thing. And then we are looking at some topics for next year, which I mentioned earlier. We will uh, hopefully within the next couple of two three weeks be able to finalize some things and get them back to you. So I I will finally uh, want to thank all of you. I want to thank the uh, people who did the papers, the people who did the uh, reviews of the papers, the management of the whole thing under uh, Vijaya, uh, fantastic, and uh, Shalini, and Meg, and so many volunteers who really helped work very, very hard. And I'm personally very grateful to all of you because I know how, how difficult it is uh, for you to do all this. And, uh, and so we will, uh, uh, I'll be leaving uh, with, uh, after this evening, I'll be gone, so tomorrow morning I'm flying out. And uh, there'll be some follow-up to this, uh, through our, uh, you know, Shalini and other people that get back to you with the, uh, you know, what happens next. But the papers have to be turned in by the end of July, final. That is exceedingly important. Is there any anything else, uh, Shalini or Vijay, you want me to announce? Any